Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, where you guys know we always got your back week after week. We are here with our very good friend, Brent Allpress, who is zooming into us from Australia. I love the fact that we have a global show, global viewership. And Brent, of course, for those um, who recognize him because he's been on our show multiple times, he is an OSINT investigative researcher. He's incredibly vital to our understanding of uh, Cambridge Analytica and how people's mental health issues are being weaponized. His uh, work has been featured in such films as People You May Know. Uh, he also has turned over his research to the January 6th committee. It's very important on our show that we do not memory hole the insurrection, that we do not memory hole Cambridge Analytica's role in psyoping people. And Brent has been working on some really interesting new stuff. It's, it's worth noting his background is also in urban architecture, music. So he's kind of a Renaissance guy helping us navigate uh, disinformation and radicalization. Brent, first of all, so great to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a pre, pre Renaissance guy. That's the <laughs> pre Renaissance guy. <laughs> we all went a bit wrong. We all went, went a bit wrong with the Renaissance. So we're trying to still unpack. <laughs> So, so uh, Brent just got back from Venice, uh, and we're going to be talking about that. In fact, I feel like we should just start right there before we get into the meat of our breaker, which is really updating people on some of the latest developments in these psyops that we are seeing in these mass radicalization techniques. Brent, tell us uh, what you were doing in Venice and Hi-Fi. Can you run some of the video of what Brent put together? Yes, I was a creative director for. So they have this. They have a every two years they have a um, uh, an international architecture biennale. They have an art one in the alternate year in Venice, and um, uh, I was creative director for RMIT for uh, researchers, colleagues. This is my pavilion, um, and there are about I think there are about uh, twelve groups or schools or, or research centers around the world that put together um so I, I put together about nine pavilions wow uh, and this is a mixture of my architecture so this is a reconstruction of demolished griffin's entry sort of chicago architects who turned up in melbourne um and then the second half of it i um i've uh put an update to the people you may know research so there's a there's an edit of the People you may know, film, documentary, and um, and then and then material that um, is partly from that uh, documentary, but also um, updates of the um, the developments that have occurred in the last year or so, with um, a shift to a kind of mass psyops model of of advertising with the He Gets Us campaign, which um, wow. cost. 12 million US for adverts in the um, in the um, in the um, uh, wow. Super Bowl, and these kind of saturation urban adverts that you will have seen on bus stops and in Times Square, they're everywhere. So the guy who's the CEO of Hobby Lobby, um, David Green, has allegedly put down a billion dollars over three years for these Jesus Gets Us adverts. Jesus suffered from anxiety too. Jesus went all in too in Vegas, which is where you go. Some of this stuff is research on, um, you know, just disclosures of the platform for micro-targeting using, uh, using mental health data also being for political campaign use. And that one there's a, um, a, um, a, uh, uh, a, a webinar on micro-targeting and, it's pretty clear what the political focus of that is, but that's for churches. So that's the sort of that's a little bit of background. The, this whole platform came out of the um, uh, City X Venice, and it came out of the um, lockdown version of Venice, which had to be online. And yeah. um, they've kept that part of the platform together as uh, for um, research groups around the world um, wow. attached to universities mostly. Um, in order to kind of have a kind of gen generous, generous platform to to gather together, um, you know, 
recent work across architecture, urban design, that sort of thing. The the, um, the exhibition itself in Venice, um, uh, particularly the Arsenale exhibition, had um, um, Alison Killing from Killing Architecture and her work on um, uh, mapping the Uyghur concentration camps um, and internment camps in China and also um, Isle Weissman from Goldsmith runs Forensic Architecture, which is a sort of using architectural and urban techniques to map social justice um, and other um, uh, events. And um, uh, there's sort of it's a literally forensics that could be applied to, to certain urban settings. So West Bank stuff is where he started. Um, and um, I'd recommend people to chase up either of those two. They're the kind of, that's where the kind of uh, interdisciplinary use of architecture, I'm mostly I'm design focused. Yeah. Qualitative, but that's where the, that's where the kind of techniques of, of architectural, I don't know, criticality and analysis and other sort of techniques kind of come together for, for other, other broader social and cultural purposes. Oh, I just, I love it. And I think it's very important because we are always being flooded with the zone of shit or shit is flooding the zone or however it goes. So we do not mem uh, remember things that just happened and we don't even pause to take a breath to analyze the repercussions of it. What's so important is what you um, were showing there, uh, how, how massively we are seeing what is essentially QAnon type messaging right there in our mass, uh, you know, marketing commercial landscape. And and can you talk about the Super Bowl ad and why that sent uh, such a you know red flag up for you? Well, I was aware of the background to it before it happened, um, and it's it's set up for a younger demographic. They're trying to um, market their version of, 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 well, they're trying to market Jesus um, to a younger demographic. Uh, but it's pitched with a whole range of uh, contemporary conflicts. It's pitched with mental health uh, and depression and anxiety as one of the key subtexts. It's pitched with, um, uh, political disillusionment that sort of sense of of, of alienation um, it's pitched with a kind of um, it sort of takes anti-establishment and, and and pushes it to the to the far right so it's a sort of far left far right kind of um, um, horseshoe op of some sorts to kind of take issues that people that younger young that they see younger people might have concerns about and and kind of flip them across from the from a from a left position to a right position. So we talk a lot about the horseshoe and I you know I just happened to glance at my phone as we were recording and it's like Jack Dorsey's endorsed you know RFK and it's like we are so familiar with this by now and people are still looking at things at face value. When you see something about you know an ad with uh, Jesus gets us he gets us what what is the subtext of this that should be alarming for Americans as well as you know people around the world? Well, look, you, the people are getting adverts still on Facebook and social media that are micro targeted. Um, so the mass advertising is a kind of saturation cover for an operation that's still occurring, where people are receiving micro targeting messaging that's uh, exploiting mental health data. Um, if you if you receive an advert from Church's Care saying feeling anxious and why so sad, you know those sorts of, and it might list a few reasons why you might be sad, or maybe you don't know why you you feel depressed. But click on this link and um, talk to somebody, and you end up talking to the um, Australian Association of Christian Counselors, who are a far right group that they've, they've partnered with Glue, and then they flick you onto a local church. Um, and you join one of their um, small groups, and then you go through that same path of of 
of um, conversion and radicalization that um, we explained um, during the um, during the the documentary people you may know that um, uh, Kat Gallen and um, and um, and um, and Charles um, Do Dr. Charles Krill yes we had both of them on the show to talk about uh, disinformed and people you may know yeah so in, in the exhibition I put together I I, I, I took a sort of 25 minute cut out of that of that documentary that uh, featured my stuff and, and stuff related to that that um, that sat with the the other more recent material um, and the um, that op is still going it's masked though and so they um, they put out a PR disaster kind of piece that said they weren't doing bad stuff anymore and anyway it was the data broker's fault and you know everything's good uh, don't scare the horses. And um, and they are still going, and they're still partnering. They have these big front end, front of house kind of ops, but the name Blue wasn't mentioned. Uh, but if you're back under the hood, it's basically a conduit uh, from from a, a, a sort of front end group. It gets us to um, pathways to um, some co I suppose it's really coercive counselling for people who are very vulnerable. Um, and then, uh, and then you're sort of fed through to to prepped um, contacts within key churches that are aligned with the uh, the overall campaign. So, um, then the campaign is uh, seeking to hoover up the unchurched in catchments around churches that are of a um, of a of a of a conservative ilk. They're really pushing a radicalization agenda. Um, they have small groups um, that are a, a, a means by which people who might be suffering from certain mental disorders or conditions or personal stress or financial stress um, uh, that they, or grief, um, at their most vulnerable, they're most open to, to um, being impacted by a persuasion campaign and conversion and um, they end up donating twice as much as anyone else. Oh. They they add to the um, they add to the uh, congregation data. The the churches who sign up for this, so they get more people joining the church. They are giving all their data across to to the um, glue operation as a kind of as part of the process. It was Cambridge Analytica and Glue were were um, contracted by the Philanthropy Roundtable, which is a co group. Um, non-profit and the uh, purpose of it was to um, shift the balance of um, demographics in key swing states so if you're married and you went to church then you're more likely to vote for a republican president and so they were, they were hammering certain key electorates yeah trying try to get those numbers up and try and get them swung to the right it's um, very very sinister because people are giving up this information willingly but they don't know what's happening on the back end. They don't know that their information that they're giving up is being uh, ultimately possibly weaponized against them. And it is sinister to, for me to hear, again, how targeted it is. When we talk about the 2016 election and ultimately Hillary Clinton only losing by 70 thousand votes collectively, we are talking about something that can actually lead to dramatic impacts. And Brent, you are on Twitter. You 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 are you you won the Radpod Brass Bullocks Award in your asymmetrical trolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talk about the world you're just talking about and you look at Musk's Twitter operation, what is the biggest concern that you have? Uh, that it's going to be used as a, a platform for disinformation for the 2024 presidential election. So um, there's a um, uh, an interview um, that I've tracked uh, where um, the um, a survey was commissioned. Effectively, it's the Council for National Policy. Um, survey. It says key individuals from the Council for National Policy did a survey to try and um, unpack, so spent a lot of money on it, try and unpack why why Trump lost. Of course, they're not meant to be mentioning that he lost, but <laughs> uh, 
but you know that and uh, and what they what they came down to was a as a surprising conclusion was that um the um twitter had a uh, uh, a uh, had a measurable impact on the loss so it's twitter discourse twitter debate um wow. so, so they they realized so now twitter was a plus for trump 2016 it was a minus uh, and 2020. Before, before you continue, let me just say that there was a period of time when people were like looking at Kamala and looking at Elizabeth Warren, and that's kind of where the left was. And me and a number of prominent Democratic uh, influencers banded together in a um, in a signal group or one of the platforms could have been WhatsApp. I don't, I don't recall. And we all decided at the same time that we were going to collectively throw in for Biden at a moment when it wasn't popular and the immediate response that we got ultimately led to articles like Biden, like Lazarus is coming back from the dead. We, we, we grabbed people with a lot of high profile accounts and a lot of followers and we started going in pro Biden. And I know from that moment, I saw it, I didn't measure it. I didn't have metrics, but I could see that there was this ability or this openness all of a sudden that people had uh, to say that they were for Biden, which hadn't been there previously. The Brent, Brent Bazell was the person who, who, who ran the, um, the, the, the analysis on the loss, and um, if you look, there was a there was some advice that came through out of the discovery for the lawsuit between Twitter and Musk, and there's ranges of um, email communications and, and messaging that came out of that discovery. One interesting one was that it was redacted in terms of who the who the exchange was with, uh, but it, it 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 had a kind of game plan for how to re reorganize Twitter if Musk took over. So it was sort of advice he was getting. Um, and it involved um, uh, the veri verification check scam where verifications became subscriptions and um, it involved trying to um, trying to deplatform activists, progressive activists on Twitter. Um, and to replatform the far right on Twitter, and that's um, to kicked along nicely. I assume that the um, that the person giving that advice is the current president of the Council for National Policy, because the details of the advice sort of seem to map with his 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 general kind of set of interests, and also he's he and Musk amplify each other. Um, and um, so that that gives me a sense of of, of where that might be going. Um, the um, so it's Tom Fitton is the person who who's the president of the Council for National Policy. Um, I have access to that kind of level of detail still on the Council for National Policy. Who I um, they're that umbrella group. The the umbrella group for all of those sort of um, far right. Um, uh, campaign groups, pressure groups, um, all the key heads of all of those other groups, like the Heritage Foundation. I'm just smiling because it was Brent's research that exposed so much of what was going on with that dark money influential organization. And you put a big spotlight on it and we are indebted to you for that. Yeah, it's still a big octopus and it's, and it's, it, it, the, the key figures who are the heads of those organizations, um, Family Research Council or the, the um, uh, uh, Americans for Prosperity or um, um, Heritage Foundation, the, the heads, when they're in the media, that's their affiliation. They don't say, oh, and so-and-so is in the key executive position in the Council for National Policy or so-and-so is a director of, of CMP Action, which is what, Ginny Thomas is. So, um, so things that look like they might be related and they might be coordinated, there's an organization that, that coordinates them and it's called the Council of National Policy. It meets twice a year, three times a year, and um, and they um, are running 
really large scale disinformation campaigns that are centrally coordinated with huge amounts of money. Um, and um, they service the extractive industries, they service the carbon industries. They're a coalition of, of uh, Repub sort of Republicans trying to push the party to the, to the right. Um, the, uh, those extractive industry interests and um, dominionists who want to end the separation of church and state and white supremacists, just to be very blunt. And those different categories aren't mutually exclusive um, by any means, but there are, you know, different, they're, they're sort of mixtures of donors and doers. That's how they describe them. The doers are the ones who end up in the media, but without the CMP affiliation because they've got their own little organisations that they're running. Yeah. Um, and, um, the, uh, and the donors, um, you know, keep their hats on and, and keep the shadows. Yeah, shadows. Hi, -fi, hi fi jump in. So, I, uh, you know, you say Tom Fitton uh, is the president of the CMP. Yeah. The, the way I know the name is he's also the Trump lawyer who was advising Trump on records retention, which is now apparently turning into something very serious here in the United States. Yeah, he's not a lawyer, but he but it's quite likely that he was advising Trump on that topic. Um, to my knowledge, he's well, he's not acting. Well, he wasn't acting as a as a retained lawyer, but was in close dialogue with the White House. So his name came up with the January Sixth Committee. He wrote the um, he wrote the I one speech for Trump. So the non-concession speech. Wow. So Tom Fitton wrote that. That was featured in the January 6th hearing. Uh, so, so that's his level of influence. So he wrote that um, a number of days before the election happened. He, he re-sent it on the day to ensure that the wording was followed. Um, and I've mapped dozens and dozens of senior CMP members who were uh, either part of the coordination or the promotion of Stop the Steal, ultimately the January 6th events, and then the kind of disinformation we've had subsequently. Now, that, that segues through into more recent occurrences with the Supreme Court. And so one of, in terms of giving an update on things, one of my concerns at the moment is that what was a, an executive coup had shifted into a um, judicial coup in, in the... Um, early part of um, of 2021. So the, the overturning of the Roe versus Wade ruling, that was um, overreach, which caused a, 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 a reaction back from women in the electorate across party lines. So I think they may, they may end up regretting that one in political terms, but they were certainly was part of the deal that this is something that they would, they would push through if they'd yeah. back Trump. But the, um, the other key thing in that same week that that decision came through, there was the, um, the overturning of the role of the EPA in regulation of um, carbon. Yes. And so that didn't get as, that didn't get as much press and it should have. That it was, was really that was the that's the real delivery. That's that, real that was that was fifty years of uh, water protections just you know taken away. And... No, 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 this, this, this is this is this is this is during the week of the Roe versus Wade decision. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm thinking of something yeah, else. We just had another that. terrible. Uh, no, it's just like another, another another iteration just in the past week. So yes. So it's part of the same key agenda. So if you want to, if you this is my so Occam's razor with the stuff. If you if you think it's all very confusing then really look for a thread running through it that says um, who benefits, qui yeah. um, bono. And, it's, um, and, the, and, and what are the key decisions that are being made? And what the key decisions are, are fundamentally um, uh, to, to, to obstruct the uptake of renewables, to enhance the extractive industry's um, abilities to extract without regulation and to expand, um, expand that economy as best as possible uh, for those vested interests, and to um, and to uh, forestall the inevitable uptake of renewables. So the so the so the 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 that's where the money is coming from, and that's where the motivation is coming from. A lot of the rest of the social division, the 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 culture wars, all those other things are a means to an end. 
They're basically trying to polarise everybody, push everybody from, in terms of their key electorate interests, push them further to the right, push the Republican Party further to the right, lock them in in a death spiral with the carbon economy and um, and um, and and push this stuff through. And they were prepared to mount a coup um, when they thought that they were, um, you know, going to lose in 2020. Well, they did lose, but they, they were prepared to mount a coup to sort of stop that. Um, the uh, in the the week of the Roe versus Wade decision, that EPA decision um, was relating to the EPA's role in in um, regulating carbon emissions as part of their kind of air pollution. Um, so Biden has introduced as in, a, in response some executive orders around environmental issues. It's one of the key things that they've done legislatively as well. So it's, it was kind of way up at the top of the list of things that they they had to do. Um, and now we've got this new decision from a majority on the Supreme Court. Not Brett Kavanaugh, interestingly. He's a dissenter. But, um, um, and it's around water quality. And it's the same sort of issue. So basically you could, you could do extractive industry mining upriver of towns that need potable water and there's nothing you could do about it because the two bodies of water are detached. Yeah. And so if you have if you have extractive industries that hit wetlands that seep into rivers and that that's upriver from a city, good luck. You just yeah. gotta you're gonna have to hope for um for state government regulation. But rivers run through states. This is the problem. You right. know, so one state that might have an interest in having the extractive industries, um, they don't they're not necessarily gonna have an altruistic view for the, the, the inhabitants of another state further down the river that have to drink the water. I so that's, all... why, that's why there are federal regulations around this stuff. Yes. Right. And, uh, and, and that's, um, so, so there's a, okay, we've, we've, we've had the Harlan Crow kind of expose of, yes. of um, effectively what appears to be bribery over a long period of time with the Thomases. Um, and that's been documented in the media. Yeah. Uh, when I did, when I sort of contributed research to the um, New York Times mag cover story with Joe Becker and um, Danny Hakim on on the Thomases, um, that aspect was in there in that story, um, and it, that it's it's kind of become the lead now. Um, yeah. There's a sort of very long. Um, uh, dubious relationship between deep pocket um, individuals who are prepared to um, bankroll and own allegedly yeah. members of the Supreme Court. Absolutely. So there's, 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 there are investigations on at the moment to um, look at the other members of the bench and see if there's a similar MO, and I think the assumption will be that there is. Yeah. And that's where – so there's a bit of a spotlight going on and a process in the background to um, to to basically reverse engineer some of those relationships, and see right, see where they might lead. Um, my expectation is that they'll you'll find there's a pattern. Yes, um, yes. So my so we've covered already a lot of turf, and it's always shocking to me that people don't realize that Nixon actually gave us the EPA. You know that you know George uh, H. W. Bush actually cared about clean air. Like there was a period of time where even these fossil fuel people understood that we do breathe the the same air and we do drink this water and we should actually give a shit about it. And that has obviously been actively stripped away with lots of money interfering with everybody's understanding of climate change. Yeah. Um, well, well, the Margaret Thatcher. Uh, was on board with action on climate change, so that yeah. gives you, that gives you a sense of the consensus in the early eighties on the science. Yeah, from nineteen eighty six onwards, the Koch Group yeah um, funded a campaign of disinformation with um, with um, with dubious scientific backing. Yeah, and, and they poured huge amounts of money into that, and I would equate climate denial with Holocaust denial as a kind of um, massive massive corrosive gaslighting of the population it's and it's surprising given the science is so clear that it still has traction but it's it's because there are 
political there's political capital be, to be made from aligning yourself with donations from the extractive industries that's very very hard to crack and, and, so, and, and they tied it in with the churchy so uh, when my studies of it showed the the coke cadre the bill the billions of dollars spent to interfere with people's understanding of of science but it was also done within the name of god too it's like i can you know recite dana rohrabacher talking about you know uh dinosaur <clears throat> flatulence they 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 used every trick in the book to uh to make people doubt the reality of climate you know change and and what what really needs to be climate justice but well, what well, you just, just said is brilliant well just to be clear the the um it was the coke group who were behind the, finance, uh, the philanthropy round table, they're the ones who poured the money into the contract between Cambridge Analytica and Glue to set up a micro-targeting platform that exploits mental health data to shift key electorates to the right in order to maintain the kind of political support for the, the extractive industries and particularly the carbon industries, so oil, gas oh. and coal. And if you get, there are very, very strange bedfellows in America over, and politically over the last five years, ten years, you go. Well, what's the common? What's the common thread? An over reliance on oil, gas, and coal as a primary source of revenue. It, it explains the relationship between Trump and Russia. Yeah. Well, you said the most brilliant thing though when I interviewed you on the anti-vax story and how Russia was so invested in our misunderstanding of our own health. And you basically said, "Hey, look, it goes back to the fossil fuel industry." because they did not want the world to shut down because then it depresses the demand. And you had a brilliant quote, which I'll probably call up before we end this, uh, where you made that connection. Well, there's a key, so one of the key things that was for me in looking at all of the kind of anti-lockdown, anti-COVID control measures, this is pre-vaccine particularly. So extremely um, uh, risky, and and um, and reckless behaviour politically from certain leaders who 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 obstructed lockdowns when there were no vaccines, when they were putting the most vulnerable members of the community at risk, the elderly and people who had other other um, uh, health conditions. And and uh, at the time in 2020, the um, oil price had collapsed. The Saudis had flooded the market in retaliation for the bombing of their own oil facilities. And um, and then when lockdown hit, well, lockdown means a, a reduction in mobility, reduction in, in petrol consumption, reduction in demand. They were desperate to get that oil price back up again. And um, and they did everything they could. So I, I dug out the letter that uh, Mike Pence wrote to the CNP um, thanking them for amplifying the, um, the the administration's agenda on 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 COVID, which in March 2020 was to um, uh, play down the seriousness of yeah. the of the pandemic, because they were desperate to just keep the economy flowing, but also keep mobility going and keep oil consumption going, and wow. um, and it's that cynical. But but there's a there's a sting in that in that tale, which is that. There is a the stats are there that there's a disproportionate impact that those measures had on the populations in those states that um, that obstructed yeah. COVID lockdowns, where the mortality rates, the, un, the the avoidable deaths of the elderly, were amplified during that period. That has an impact on the the the, um, the voter base of of the Republicans who rely on an older. An, an older demographic broadly it, it was so crazy they were killing their own uh, uh, you know somebody I, said and I, somebody, somebody said and i believe it that if trump had actually masked up early on he might be our president right now which is absolutely utterly terrifying i don't know if it's true but you know um, well ironic, ironically he backed vaccines you know, yeah it's, it's, well, a, it's, it's just tricky tricky territory because he was playing two games there yes uh, and and he was he was um, pushing uh, a religious agenda around keeping churches open and um, you know we we're going to restart the economy for Easter and lots of nonsense like that. But the um, this is back in 2020, 
Um, but there, there's two there's two things that I think are going to impact on the Republicans. One is that um, their their own voter base were 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 very adversely affected by those um, those reckless policies, and um, and uh, the um, a youth vote and 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 the women's vote across party lines around issues like Roe versus Wade. Um, are going to galvanise a vote that perhaps would be a little bit more complacent generally, and so I think going forward that they they're going to really struggle if they if there's anything like some sort of federalisation of um, of um, the banning of abortion as an agenda in the election. Then, um, two third two thirds of America don't want it, and we've yeah, seen no. we've seen voters yeah. voting for that. Um, high yeah, five. Can- Go ahead and bring us home. I have one one last thing I want to ask him, but you go ahead and jump in. All right. So <clears throat> we talk about Clarence Thomas. Yep. That's Harlan Crow. That's a billionaire. Yep. We talk about the Hobby Lobby. Uh, he gets a sigh up. That's yep. another billionaire. Very strongly. We, uh, we, we talk about Cambridge Analytica. That's uh, Mercer. That's another billionaire. Yep. Uh, Mercer is also a key founder, a founding investor in um, OpenAI. Just a little, yeah. little, little oh, landing. Yeah, great. Yeah, wonderful. We don't know what uh, kind of data that's going to start harvesting. Okay, so it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, but we have a fucking billionaire problem. Yes. Well, I mean, you, and it, there's a, I mean, there's oligarch, oligarchies and. These people have the resources to manipulate the population through through influence campaigns. So to do that takes money, and um, and so they're they're also they're the ones who are funding the politicians. So yes, we do have a billionaire problem. I mean, uh-huh. well, Musk is another one. You know, that's well, uh-huh. well absolutely Musk, it's Peter Thiel. I mean, there's so many we could we could go yeah. on for days. But yeah. here, what I what I want to land the plane with is, I think that. We are laboring under a misconception that was imposed on us, at least in the United States, by Citizens United. When the Supreme yeah. Court said that money equals speech, that's a lie. Money equals influence, and that is far more powerful. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think if there's transparent donation laws, that's going to favor democracy, and dark money doesn't favor democracy. Um, democracy dies in the shadows and sunlight's the best disinfectant. And I am so appreciative of your work because you do so many things that are so incredibly important to bringing that sunlight. And when, when we have some really daunting stuff like this, I always want to leave our people, our viewers, with where we're winning and what is hopeful. And we are seeing, for example, taking away women's health care rights, uh, has has resulted in backfiring for the authoritarian right in America. What else do you see that's hopeful? Um, because 2024, it's already a shit show. Already on Twitter, you're seeing people trying to take out, you know, one uh, influential pro democracy activist or reporter after another. We're also watching lawfare occur in America. Our podcast partner, Jim Stewartson, is being sued by Mike Flynn. My investigative reporting partner uh, is being sued by Donald Trump. We just listened to Bandy Lee uh, earlier today, and she, of course, is dealing with Alan Dershowitz getting her fired from her you know, very important and pivotal uh, position, and she's fighting that. Carol Cadwallader, obviously, fighting uh, Aaron Banks. None of this is happening in a vacuum. And of course, Twitter being, you know, Musk's land grab in an information war as he runs the Twitter operation, we're watching very valuable people uh, take a lot of psychological battering and, uh, and it's having an impact. So with all of that, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to say, just like you've told me in the past, many of these people were referring to are actually making mistakes and are probably overshooting their mark. One of the key ones is um, initiating uh, defamation lawsuits that backfire on them. 
the discovery from those lawsuits yeah. are far, far more damaging to them than it is to any sort of cause they might be pushing of their. Uh, so there's the the, I think the um, the recent um, News Corp. Um, yes, that's good. This is a key one. Yeah. Um, as a result of that, Lachlan Murdoch dropped a lawsuit against Crikey, which is a a, a news blog in Australia, um, oh. because, because uh, Crikey put out a piece that said that um, the Murdochs were unindicted co co-conspirators. So Lachlan was suing them for that. Uh, when they then tabled or, or notified they were going to table all the discovery from the American case in the Australian case, um, Lachlan. Uh, so was Crikey able to counter sue? Because I mean, that's obviously what we're no, looking at. No. Lachlan, as soon as they said they were going to table all the stuff from the um, from the settled case in the US, uh, in the Australian case, um, uh, Lachlan Murdoch walked away. And um, there's been a number of uh, instances recently where um, it's very, very hard to to um, defend yourself in a defamation case um and and the, so the media has been has 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 been using the um the truth defense and um it's holding so that that's a positive i think um and that suggests that uh in the outside of the influence economy in the when you put evidence on on record and it's and it's looked at objectively by by a jury or by judges who have legal criteria, then the gaslighting is just more evidence of of uh, of, um, of of deceit and and fraud, and so um, so that's that that's where the that's where these sorts of disinformation operations hit the hard wall. Um, so I I I have confidence that so the the regulatory authorities have uh, put some of their teeth back in. And have been, <laughs> they've been sharpened in the meantime because they were taken out for about four years. Particularly yes, they were. Oh my God, that's so good. Oh, that's well, they, so good. Back in though, and um, and uh, there's certain um, um, there's certain investigations going on at the moment that um, will will bear fruit over the next year or so. Um, there are. A bunch of very very powerful organisations that have been greedy, and so while they've been engaging in this sort of disinformation influence campaigns, they've also had their snouts in the trough, and they've left breadcrumbs everywhere, and they are very very porous. So my assumption from the information I have on that is that that's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt them through 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 um, a range of different large regulatory authorities it's going to hurt them badly because they have been very very naughty <laughs> but how much money could you make? how much money could you make if you had access to mental health data for for uh, monetizing reasons just how much money could you make and and who might use who might use that 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 data in order to push a particular news organization or a particular publishing product or a particular um, cinema outlet or a particular um, other other piece of product for a particular market. So so yes, they're involved in in the um, in politics and they're involved in social engineering. They've also just been basically um, um, uh, making money out of it, and it's that greed. It's it's what will, it's what's damaged Clarence Thomas's reputation in the last six months. Is just the kind of the blatant, um, the, the the blatant um, quid pro quo that appears to have occurred um, with um, payments to his wife's consultancy for certain sorts of um, relationships over time that might favour the donor um, in the Supreme Court. So I think you'll, you'll find that there's a kind of, um, there's a, 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 the long tail for this will be the um, um, greed 
greed will be the undoing of the um it's greed that's causing them to to do this interference in the first place yeah they yeah. don't they don't care about the impacts on others they are greedy they're voracious and um and they um they extract it's an extractive mentality they're extracting they're extracting from society, they're extracting from culture, they're extracting from politics, they're mining their way through things, and they le they're leaving a, um, um, a waste trail that's relatively easy to follow. <laughs> Thank you for landing the plane, Brent. That was awesome. I love it. The greed of disinformation and the breadcrumbs they've left behind. This is so great. Thank you so very much for being with us here today. We really needed an update from you, and I feel like we got it. Yeah, yeah. Watch the space though, because there's something. There's there's more to come on that. On that. Front. Okay. Okay. Great. Nice. All right. Well, we will look so forward to that. Thank you so very much, my friend. You go have a very beautiful day, and we are going to call it a night over here. Okay. I've got one one more plug. Oh yes, please. Okay. There's a new film coming out. Uh, it's called Bad Faith. I've contributed research to it, and it looks at Christian nationalism and the impact on January 6th. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, Steve, Steve, Steve Ujlaki and, um, and Chris Jones are the directors, and that's, that's, um, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a key key film that's, um, that's just hit the post-production phase, and um, it'll be out before the end of the year. Are you going to be able to uh, um, come back and talk to us about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And bring the directors? Bring, yeah, well, you should talk to them, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, um, I am going to go to a rock and roll show and I will uh, see you guys. Uh, I'll see you on the tweeters until it becomes a burning hell hole uh, and we all have to flee. Until then, we'll just keep on fighting the good fight. I'm digging in. <laughs> me too. Me too. Me as well.